On behalf of Marita Rivero, Executive Director for Boston's Museum of African American History, and as you know, the museum has a location here and on Nantucket Island. I want to remind you that the museum's mission is dedicated to preserving, conserving, and accurately interpreting the contributions of African Americans in New England from the colonial period through the 19th century, and to serving as a convener for important conversations having to do with African Americans, like the one we're doing tonight. Um, you are going to find on your seats membership forms, so you can be a part of all of this, and a reminder that there are a list of upcoming activities um, in the next few weeks, including the December 1st Living Legends Gala, which some, some people may know about quite well. It's December 3rd on Sunday. Cocktails at 4.30 and the program starts at 5. So please take a look at that and be aware that that's something special. So tonight, Millennium <coughs> Conversation, Race in the Public Dialogue. This is a part of a continuing dialogue sponsored by the museum, which will this year tackle the issue of race in many areas. I'm Callie Crossley, host and executive editor, uh, editor for WGBH's Under the Radar with Callie Crossley. I also host, thank you. I host Basic Black and I'm panelist for Beat the Press. And it's my great honor to introduce our two guests tonight. Now, you know their bios are huge, so I've pared them down <laughs> <laughs> to get to some essence. Jelani Cobb is the Ira A. Lipman Professor of Journalism at Columbia University. He joined the faculty there last year. He is a prolific writer, author of many, many articles, in addition to his work as a regular contributor for the New Yorker magazine. He writes frequently about race, politics, history, and culture, and is often sought for his take on major race and racism issues, quoted in publications including the New York Times, The Root, .com, and he has many appearances as a radio and TV guest, including WGBH's Frontline. And he is well known for his Twitter account, which is always on fire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 really, I'm really trying to cut that out. <laughs> well, <laughs> he has been awarded the uh, WGA East Walter Bernstein Award for Social Justice, the 2015 Sidney Hillman Award for Opinion and Analysis, and he is the author of the book, The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama, and the Paradox of Progress. That's Jelani Cobb. <laughs> Joanne Reed is host of AM Joy, which airs Saturday and Sunday mornings on MSNBC, <laughs> where she also... <laughs> She also serves as a political analyst and substitute anchor for the entire MSNBC. <laughs> <laughs> Let's tell the truth. <laughs> her own show has earned top ratings, beating her CNN competition with double digit growth. <laughs> Joy hosts top newsmakers and interrogates the issues of the day with political analysts and a variety, wide variety of experts. Jelani Cobb has been her guest, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Her no-nonsense style has helped her star rise at the network. She came to the attention of a lot of new viewers last year after she firmly told one difficult guest, you will not come on my show and make things up. <laughs> <laughs> her columns and articles have also appeared in many publications, including the New York Times, the Daily Beast, where she recently wrote about Donna Brazil's, Brazil's bombshell. Her latest book is We Are the Change We Seek, the speeches of Barack Obama, co-authored with E.J. Dion. That's Joanne Reed. <laughs> so our conversation is, and, and the race dialogue tonight is really looking at these powerful and potent symbols, the Confederate statues, the Confederate flag, and then actually the American flag, and how now it's become quite a political and um, symbol used in, the, in a con an interesting conversation about race. So I want to start off with uh, asking you two where you are at now as you think about the power and the impact of these symbols. Mm -hmm. Because I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. They were all around me. I mm -hmm. knew what it meant. I just never thought, however, I would experience a time where there is a torch lit parade with people carrying symbols to protect a Confederate statue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that seems just 
another otherworldly to me. So Jelani, would you start off and just give us a little context about where you're at as you think about these symbols more broadly? Mm -hmm. Uh, so first I want to say thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to be here this evening. Always happy. We just realized that Joy and I had never had like a public conversation before, so we're happy to be able to do that. Um, our really interesting conversations are like mostly on the cell phone after somebody does something trifling. <laughs> <laughs> like, Joy, did you hear all of this? <laughs> um, and uh, I was also like kind of topping this off was when I found out that this was you know a stop on the Underground Railroad. Uh, because November 9th of last year, I was actually looking up the Underground Railroad, thinking that we might actually have to use those paths again. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, let me see exactly how did we get, what is the North Star again? <laughs> <laughs> I need to figure this out. Um, and and in, that, in that vein, uh, I think that, you know, there's been, the beginning of this year, um, I covered uh, Dylan Roof's trial. In, in Charleston. And uh, if you don't recall, he's the young man who uh, killed nine people in uh, the sanctuary of the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. And he did so uh, in his uh, explanation as a kind of rallying cry for white people to wake up and recognize that they were besieged by black people and they were losing their place in the world and so on. He, you know, kind of posed prominently with the Confederate flag. And as I was walking back and forth to the trial each day, um, I passed this building, and somehow, uh, for the better part of a week, I didn't realize that the building was actually the Confederate Museum of Charleston. Uh, and so I pop in, and there are two women there who um, could not have been more polite, and they, you know, welcomed me and. Uh, they asked, you know, why I'm visiting, and I said I was here to, to uh, write about Dylan Roof. And there's one woman who's older, um, and she said, "Oh, that young man. They should just, they should just get rid of him." And uh, I was like, "What do you mean?" And she's like, "They should just kill him." And uh, I said, "Why do you think that?" She said, "What he did was so terrible." Uh, and I was struck by that response because I said, "Well, what do you make?" of the idea that he did what he did as a tribute to the very cause that you all are memorializing with this museum. And I, mean, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so um, she said, oh, that's not true. That's not true. You know, uh, the Confederacy was not about uh, murder, and it was not about racism, and, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and it was so wild that she was saying that, so she was standing next to this Confederate cannon. Right? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And it was like, like the irony collapsing on top of the irony. Uh, and the thing that struck me was that this was enraging to Ruth. It was enraging to the people who you saw gathered outside Charlottesville. Because as, um, as much contempt and disdain as I have for the people who uh, authored these actions, we have something in common. And what we have in common is the belief that we need to tell the truth about history. And they are saying they think of themselves as insulted and compromised when the descendants of the Confederacy cannot proudly admit that the Confederacy was devoted to the cause of white supremacy. And that's what they want to restore themselves to, the point where they can unapologetically be who they are. And my work in writing and as a historian and everything I've done has been to the point that we can uh, very clearly understand what the historical record is. And so this is a kind of for them, a kind of redemption movement, a kind of um, purification movement. They want to return to uh, not the reform Southern identity. They want to return to the fundamentalist Southern identity. They think they've gotten away from their roots, and that's where they're trying to go back to. And they see themselves as a kind of corrective. And that's all of these things, I think, are kind of an explanation of this. And the last thing that I say about this, just as a kind of summation, is that a century ago, a century before exactly the, the attacks um, in uh, Charleston, uh, the film Birth of a Nation came out. And of course, you know, Boston was very integral to the opposition to that film uh, with Monroe Trotter you know, leading the way, leading the charge against Birth of a Nation. Uh, but what D.W. Griffith was talking about, people were really upset about what he said about the past. 
and the way he depicted the Klan in these heroic terms and so on. But Griffin's vision of the past is not nearly dis as disturbing as what he was proposing for the present, he, for the future. Mm -hmm. He was hoping that white Southerners and white Northerners could come together around their mutual contempt for black people. That's what's called Birth of a Nation, mm -hmm. released 50 years after the end of the Civil War. He was like, look, this is insane. We're all white people. We still hate each other. We have to recognize that we have a common enemy, and that enemy is the Negro. And this has to be the basis for our reconciliation. The fact that he was accurate, that you have a New York dude, a Queens dude mm -hmm. in Donald Trump, and a Boston dude in John Kelly defending the honor of Robert E. Lee mm -hmm. is the ultimate realization of what D.W. Griffith was proposing in 1915. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Joy? <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks for letting me follow that, Callie. <laughs> well, thank you all. I want to also thank Marita uh, and Chandra and Chase, who were my uh, buddies who took me on a, a fab fabulous tour of Nantucket uh, this summer with the family. So we, you know, we got to hang out a little bit then, and all, obviously, uh, Lamershi and the team here at this amazing space. It's, it, it is really uh, incredible. And thank you, of course, both of you. We're going to one day maybe we'll publish our text messages on crazy things happen and call it What the Hell? <laughs> Let this be a book. That's what, that has to be released 25 years after Later. your death, right? <laughs> right. Days. What the hell? Um, so, you know, it's interesting because growing up, I grew up, in, um, I was born in Brooklyn, but I grew up in Denver, Colorado. And I remember as kids, my sister, my brother, and I, I'm the middle, my older sister, my younger brother, and I, we used to watch the Dukes of Hazard. And, you know, like a lot of, you know, all, I lived in an 80% black neighborhood. All my friends watched the Dukes of Hazard. It, and mm -hmm. that Confederate flag on Bo and Luke Duke's car mm -hmm. never meant anything to me. It, it just was nothing other than a cute car. If you had bought me a little die cast version of it and given it to me for Christmas, I would have been like, great, them Dukes, them Dukes. Mm -hmm. I thought it was funny. And, and it, 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 you sort of fast forward, or I fast forward then to when I was in college, um, and a student who was from Virginia, um, decided as a way to sort of uh, bombastically declare their pride in their heritage, they hung a Confederate, giant Confederate flag in their window. Uh, and it was a window that faced the library so that any student um, who was in the quad and needed to walk over to the library had to be sort of under the oppression of this giant flag. And of course, by then I had figured out that, you know, the sort of banality of what we'd done with the Confederate flag made it just a joke in the, in the Dukes of Hazard and sort of taken the sting out of it, at least in terms of it being a cultural symbol. Um, it was put right back in by the time I was old enough to really understand the history of it. Um, and it was a huge blow up on campus. It really became as this massive controversy. I remember I ended up writing um, this, this, this open letter to the person and, and you know, distributing them around campus anonymously to try to get them to understand that no matter what you think that flag is for you, that flag is a symbol. You might as well be waving a bloody shirt at every black mm -hmm, student mm -hmm. on this campus. That's a symbol of death, uh, destruction, uh, racism. Um, you know, when the Confederate states seceded, it's funny to me that the, the, their descendants now try to say it was about something else, when in the documents they said that we are seceding in order to have slavery for the Negro forever, that we will never give up the That's institution right. of slavery, that mm -hmm. far from giving it up, we want to spread it to the West. You know, the place where I grew up in Colorado, mm -hmm. when, they, when the country expanded westward, the sort of, uh, uh, the one, uh, you know, irrefutable claim of the southern states was that, well, those states must have slaves. Mm -hmm. That we, that we want slavery to spread throughout the land and to exist forever in their constitutions. It said perpetual, forever. Um, and then you have the idea that, you know, what that symbol was. It wasn't even the symbol of their army. Their armies were completely defeated. The South was a defeated, you know, wannabe nation uh, of traitors. And they understood themselves to be a defeated people for quite some time. And they never raised those flags in these southern states after the Civil War, because they were defeated and occupied by the victorious North. So this was a people who, at least in Reconstruction, were forced to reckon with the reality of black personhood for the first time, of black elected officials from Mississippi, senators mm -hmm. going to the United States Congress and saying, I'm a human being for the first time, having to deal with that. And they were a defeated people for quite some time until they roared back and replaced Reconstruction with redemption. And it was violent and vicious. If you look at the history of the country from the you know, 1870s through the 1930s, it's one of terrorism. It's one of trying to force black citizens back into the box, 
force them back into a place of perpetual servitude and fear. You know, um, you know, I was talking earlier, Dolly and I were talking about the fact that I teach this class, and when I explained to my students that lynching is almost a clinical term mm -hmm. for what really was barbarism mm -hmm. in an attempt to stuff black people back into the box. Mm -hmm. You know, people like Pitchfork Ben Tillman, who you see That's statues right. of everywhere. That's right. You know, I remember when I was going and covering the Confederate flag being brought down to South Carolina, um, I'm a Marriott customer, so they put me in this converted old mill that's a Marriott. They put me in the Ben Tillman suite, because I got to upgrade. I had to move, I had to tell them, and, they, and they're wondering, what is wrong with this person that you won't stay in a nicer room? I said, put me back in a regular room, mm -hmm. because I know too much, mm -hmm. and I can't stay in a room named after Ben Tillman, who literally said the only way to make the Negro understand he is not our equal and will not marry our daughters and send his children to school with our children is to kill him. We have to kill them all if we have to, because they'll never be our equal. We'll just kill them. Mm -hmm. And he's got statues all over the place. And so you think about those symbols that weren't erected after the war. This is a defeated people. The South was completely destroyed. You know, William comes to Sherman didn't play around. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. burned their cities to the ground. And when this defeated people decided to take back their, what they saw as their pride, right, and their really white supremacist uh, order, um, they belatedly did it by erecting this symbol, but they did it at really specific, really kind of interesting times. Um, a lot of those symbols didn't even go up in the South until the 1950s, until Brown v. Board said to them, you have to let your kids go to school with their kids. Those children get to come into your schools. And the South said, hell no. And not only will we not do it, we're gonna make the black citizens of this community live under that banner. We're gonna make them go to the courthouse under big statues of the generals who fought to keep their forebears in bondage. We're gonna make you see that everywhere you go, at the courthouse, at the library, at the Capitol. You're gonna walk under those symbols and know that we are boss. Know that this is our southern state. This is not your country, it's our country. And to hell with you. Those symbols meant something affirmatively this was a defeated people saying, we, we're not defeated at all. You know, wars don't end when the victor plants their flag and declares victory. They end when the defeated relent, mm -hmm. right? They end when the defeated admit they are defeated. The problem we have, I think, uh, in the history of this country is that the defeated have never really admitted to defeat. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they have a lot of apologists all over the country for whom we found out in this last election, race is a stronger compulsion and bond than even economics. You know, even disgust is weaker than the bonds of race. You know, there are a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump who claim to have been disgusted by him, but what, comp what compelled them to support him anyway? He literally said, I bond us together by one thing, race, well, and gender. You know, and, and so I, I think that you know when I look at those symbols now, I think about the fact that we let them become so banal for so long that we forgot how powerful they were to the formerly defeated. They're quite powerful to them. Uh, and the last thing I'll say on that is that they've even gone so far now is that the younger sort of uh, ahistoric ones, the ones who don't know anything about history, the young people who call themselves the alt-right, they have no idea what they're doing. They're going around, you know, with crew-cut haircuts and thinking that they uh, that Depeche Mode is their favorite band. You know, these are, mm -hmm. are kind of not the brightest people. Um, I mean, they love Depeche Mode, the alt-right. They love, and Depeche Mode says, we hate you. I don't want you to listen to our music. You're not new wave, but they think they're new wave. Um, that these people have even adopted the symbols of the people their grandparents went to war to fight. They've adopted the Nazi symbols. They don't even know anything about history. But that bond of racial superiority, that need to feel that this one thing excuses all my failures, if I can't get a job, if I can't get a girlfriend, no one wants to marry me, my life sucks. But I can excuse all of that and cover it over with this bond of race. And so I think these symbols, they may not, you know, they may have sort of lost their, their I don't know if they've lost their sting even to people of color, but for those people, those formerly defeated people, to them, it's what they've got left. Mm -hmm. Can I add one thing really quick, too, about that, to the point that, um, that Joy made? <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I think that, that point about never, the South never having relented, Du Bois tells us this uh, story in Black Reconstruction, gives his explanation in Black Reconstruction, where he says that the country has never invest, been invested in telling the truth about that war. And so he said that after the war, 
The South could not bring itself to admit that it had fought nearly to its last man to preserve the right to buy, sell, rape, beat, exploit, breed, and uh, use black people. Like this was the cause that you were willing to die for. And so they invented this fiction that had been about this constitutional abstraction called states' rights, mm -hmm. which as Joy pointed out, they said literally in those documents, we are going to war to fight for the preservation of slavery. And so the South never wanted to actually admit this. At the same time, the North would never concede that it owed the continued existence of American democracy to those 190,000 black soldiers who came in and saved Lincoln's government. And so it was like the French who, when they were being liberated at the end of World War II, uh, and all these Senegalese soldiers were responsible, and they would not allow those Senegalese soldiers to liberate Paris. They said they've already been humiliated by the Germans. We cannot allow them to again be humiliated by Africans coming to their rescue. And it was that same logic. They owed a, a debt to democracy. And we think about that with, with Lincoln, when he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, he was fully invested in the idea of deporting black people. He wanted to uh, <laughs> free the Negro and then get rid of the Negro. Uh, and never does it, he countenance the idea of getting rid of the white people who were, one, trying to overthrow his government and who had already tried to assassinate him and eventually would. The question of expelling the Confederates never came up. And so there was this kind of fraternal agreement that we won't actually tell the truth about the history here, and we still continue to reap the, the implications of it. So I want to just raise up the, the, the whole question of telling the truth and, and what Joy led with, which was a great amount of detail about some of the history, which, by the way, was an uh, important segment on our show recently. And if you read the comments, people are writing what I'm about to ask you, which is why I didn't know this. Oh, my goodness. Oh, thanks for, and there are a few people that did know, thanks for telling the truth. It's been shared now quite a bit because people are looking for the history. So the question is, if we know now that mass number of people are ahistorical, they actually don't know the history. Yeah. So how do they tell the truth? Because they don't know the history. Yeah. So that's where we are in beginning to try to interrogate what truth is around this story. And I don't know how you start then, because for so long, to your point, Jelani, is that it's been papered over with what people thought or imagined or whatever, yeah. but nobody mm -hmm. went well, to the And it's interesting, if you think about it, the, you know, the sort of project of putting the country back together after the Civil War, it was sort of delayed. Reconstruction was the sort of the, the positive version of that. You know, I think Ulysses S. Grant doesn't get enough credit for, you know, he had a lot of personal issues, he had a lot of corruption mm -hmm. issues, but he did try, and there was sort of a nobleness to the effort. Uh, that effort didn't last very long at all. By the time you get to the 1920s, to Woodrow Wilson, probably one of the most racist, vicious presidents we've ever had, uh, the guy who screened Birth of a Nation, mm -hmm. and who, by the way, is responsible for that national anthem, that song being our national anthem, because like, people didn't, people don't often know either that the country didn't have a, a national anthem, right, for a very long time. Uh, Woodrow Wilson's daughter happened to sing a popular version of that song, which was uh, basically a popular war ditty, popular army ditty, um, but there were other options, right? They could have picked other options that are much more positive. America the Beautiful mm -hmm. existed at that time, and people used to sing that song a lot too. And when they thought between America the Beautiful and a, a song about the War of 1812, whose third stanza is about how the Negro slave who went to fight for the British will essentially burn in hell, mm -hmm. Right, and that's what the third stanza of that song is. You wonder why people consider it problematic and, and prefer to hear it on their knees, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's right. It's, it's only the national anthem because Woodrow Wilson, in addition to being a terrible man, was also essentially Donald Trump, who said, my family, my daughter likes this song. She's recorded a version of it. People are buying the version, uh, the print version of her popular song. I'm gonna do a, an executive order to make my baby's song the national anthem. And Congress was like, what? <laughs> no. And they didn't act on it for 15 years. But 15 years later, there you go. Congress acted on it and signed off on it. And suddenly, that's our national anthem for really no good reason other than that Woodrow Wilson's daughter liked it. Mm -hmm. right? So our history, we're not conversant with even the things we think are important have trivial origins. 
I mean, the other day I was reading about, uh, you know, since we're not talking a lot about Alabama, Alabama gets its new state motto in 1923 um, when the, the woman who came up with it, her husband, had started this Alabama Historical Society that was all about doing what Jelani was talking about, rewriting the history of Alabama. Mm -hmm. And the motto was, we will fight for our rights. We shall fight for our rights in Latin. And they come up with this motto, which essentially is an, an aggressive states' rights motto, right? Essentially saying, we're going to fight for our rights, not meaning all the citizens of Alabama, but the white citizens of Alabama. Um, and part of what this woman, her job was to sort of change the history of the South to one that would be positive for Southerners. And I, I'm getting somewhere with this, sorry, I'm gonna be quicker about it. But it was partly because the, the country was grappling with some of the bigger social issues. What do we do with the aging? What do we do with the pensioners, including the Civil War pensioners? Do we cut the, former, the, the, the Confederate veterans out when we're trying to create this thing called Social Security? Do we cut them out of veterans' benefits? Do, or do we give it to the whole country? And as a way to get Northerners to accept the idea that you would give the descendants of Southern traitors any pension benefits, any benefits at all, the North participated in this rewriting of Southern history. Mm -hmm. The North enthusiastically embraced this idea of Dixie as this sort of benign thing. Go look at it in Bugs Bunny cartoon. Mm -hmm. And they sort of portray Dixie as, you know, mm -hmm. they rewrote them into this sort of benign thing as part of a way to reconcile other issues like economics, like how do we deal with the poor and the aging. And so I don't know how you undo that when it wasn't just the South that foisted it on the North. We, the North participated right. in it. The federal government right. participated in it. So how do you have a, begin to have a dialogue then if you really are having two different conversations? Because you have some people who are informed about it and, other, and a lot of folks who have no idea. And they have gone for the okie doke frankly, <laughs> about yeah. the stories that they hold. I think um, it's, it's, it's harder to keep the truth um, Jim Crow into you know, the background now. Uh, because you know you have Joy, you know who's on TV, and she's talking about these things. There are a lot of people out there. Social media, these conversations, you know, with Black Twitter is on it. You do not <laughs> want to get on the bad side. Of black Twitter. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> and you know, one of the things that's impressed me is like the extent to which people in, on on Black Twitter will come at you with footnotes. Yes. Um, well. You know, and so uh, I think that. There are people who would, who are writing, you know, about these things. Um, and there are people who would, in, in the documentary world, and Ava uh, Duvernay did what she did with Thirteenth. Um, mm -hmm. I think that these conversations are, or more, are more and more prominent um, for people who want to know. Right. The other part of it is the kind of self exile from this information, or self sequester from this kind of information. They don't want to know. Uh, and so we can have this conversation about Alabama and not talk about, as if, you know, like it took the point at which uh, uh, we discovered that Roy Moore uh, had this penchant for chasing after adolescent girls that people even blinked. And some of them haven't blinked yet. <laughs> I mean, all of his, his racism, his homophobia, his uh, Islamophobia, all those things, they were kind of checking those boxes, like, you know, sure. And you know, I feel like I can talk bad about Alabama because one of the best things my mother ever did was leave Alabama. <laughs> and she, she told me that. She said, she said that uh, when she was 17 years old, she realized there was no future for her in Alabama and that she would one day have children and there would be no future for them in Alabama. Um, and so, I, I mean, this is kind of where we are on this. Um, there's one other thing, too. I mean, we were talking about kind of these questions about, about history. Um, when we looked at uh, South Carolina, there, there's that monument to Ben Tillman um, on the grounds. When they took down the, the flag, uh, the Confederate flag, they left that monument to Ben Tillman there. And they left the monument to J. Marion Sims, who was the, uh, the gynecologist, the father of gynecology, who mm -hmm. experimented on enslaved women. Um, who could not consent, obviously. Uh, there's the monument to Strom Thurmond, the Dixie Dixiecrat uh, presidential candidate in 1948 who ran on a segregation platform. His platform was segregation. The other plank was segregation. 
and then the final plank was even more segregation, <laughs> um, which did not, of course, prevent him from impregnating the black woman who worked as a domestic in their household. He didn't believe in that kind of segregation. Um, and so this is what's remaining there uh, in South Carolina. But the most disturbing thing at that, that capital is the statue of George Washington. And um, you know, when I first saw it, I didn't know what it was. I was like, oh, okay, it's the statue of George Washington. Uh, and then I was talking to a gentleman who had done uh, kind of extensive history on the Confederate flag. He was like, but why is it there on the, the grounds of the state capitol? I was like, because it's the state capitol. And he was like, but why is it there in, in proximity to the Confederate flag? And then it hit me. Because they have always believed their version of America is white supremacist. They believe that in fighting for the Confederate cause, the North were the traitors. But what had been guaranteed to them in the Constitution was this racial hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And they stuck George Washington there to say, we are actually fighting for the legacy of 1776. You are not. And they said that with some basis. <laughs> we were looking at the Constitution and, and the protection for the slave trade and the three-fifths compromise and the fugitive slave clause. Uh, and you know, the ways in which black people are written out of the Declaration of Independence, it's clear that there is a kind of hierarchy that's implicit in the minds of these people. No matter how morally conflicted Jefferson may have been in his private moments, what he authored was a hierarchical doctrine for, that he proposed we would call democracy. And so they felt that they were fighting for the version of democracy that they had been promised. Yeah. And you know, and just, I'm sorry to jump in, but you know, it, thinking about what you're saying, Johnny, you know, if you go to Germany, right? I mm -hmm. went to Germany as a high school student, and I was amazed. That it, we, we did this whole European Europe, trip through Europe, and when we got to Germany, we all split up um, and stayed with a family. So I stayed with this family in Munich, and it was. And there was. I was 15. There, there was a boy. Their son was 15. We we're the same age, and even the 15-year-old. It was amazing to me how openly they talked about Nazism. Mm -hmm. mm. We went all out to dinner. Um, and the father, who first of all drove, but when we got in the car with him, he put two, he put gloves on, he gripped that steering wheel, he hit the gas on that autobahn. I've never seen any people in Germany drive like maniacs. I, and I drive fast, and it was literally like ah, but I mean that. So literally, these people drive like crazy people. But the dad, but in addition to being crazy drivers, um, they're very open about talking about Nazism because they'll have family members, they had a grandfather, somebody was a not. They, are, they, they, they have reconciled themselves to the horror of their own history. And they don't want to forget. And they won't forget it. You can't even, you cannot say the symbols of Nazism, you can't do the, the, the gestures. It's illegal, mm -hmm. okay? And, and, I, and you think about the fact that America cannot reckon, we can't, you can't even talk about it. Mm -hmm. Americans get, the, get their backs up immediately if you start talking about our history. I think part of it is because Germany has a much longer history. Mm -hmm. They see Nazism as something that happened along the arc of a much longer mm -hmm. Teutonic history. You know, the British will look at, you know, what they did in World War II in the context of a much longer sort of history and legacy. There are two, there are a couple of countries, there are a few countries that were specifically created to be slave republics. Well, the Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. But when the Caribbean ended slavery, they, the, the white people, for the most part, left mm -hmm. and said, take the country, we're done. It's your, you deal with it, even if they still have a colonial relationship with them. You know, the Haitians got rid of the French. They expelled the French. And they, a lot of them, they expelled them to New Orleans, by mm -hmm. the way, which yeah. is right. a, a yeah. Haitian, right? That's right. Um, whereas in the, in the United States, the whole birth of the country is as a slave republic. White supremacy is written into the documents. It's in the founding documents that we are affirmatively a slave republic, mm -hmm. explicitly written so that there's a certain value to being a free white man that if you're free, white, and male, you just have more rights than everyone else. That all these God-given rights that we talk about and the rights of man, and we're getting very ephemeral with it and esoteric, but they really only apply to free white men. They don't apply to unlanded white men, they don't apply to women, certainly, and they definitely don't apply to the enslaved. They don't apply to Native Americans, they don't apply to anybody but free, white, landed men. It's hard for Americans to reconcile with that when at the same time, World War II and World War I gave us the gave us the opportunity as the one unscathed country, as the eagle that swooped in and saved the French and saved the Europeans, we walked out of that with a heroic narrative about America that Americans cannot let go of. Americans are always Captain America. We are never the villain. America is Superman, right? right? America is the good guy. America is the savior, not the villain. 
And Americans cannot really conceive of themselves as villainous unless you are a black person or That's a brown right. person or a, a person American, of color, right. a Native American, because you see the villainy in our history, and you, for you, that's not a contradiction with loving the country. But for a lot of white America, I do find that people get very brittle on the subject of America's villainy. We can't deal with it. And South Africa has a similar problem, to be honest with you. They have a, a similar problem. So I don't know how you get to talk about history in a country where people can't conceive of America as villainous. They can't conceive of the founders as having any villainy in them because it's not part of our heroic narrative. We have to break that. And the last thing I'll say is that Barack Obama, for, to his credit, thought that he could sort of find a way to get in between. And as somebody who's, because he's such a sort of positive man, and he has such a um, enthusiasm for America, that he could somehow address it. I honestly think that only white America can address that with white America at this point. I walked away from that experience of eight years of Obama thinking, we can't impart that to white America, because they won't they, they're not going to hear it from us. At some point, you would hope that there will be some dignified figure who will come to the White House who will be, I'm being honest, I'm not trying to diss Donald Trump, but I think at some point, you know, the, the sort of dream would be that you'd have some dignified figure in that White House, or maybe not in the White House, just some, but, ha, but a white person mm -hmm. who's willing to take that on, because I think they'd have a better chance. I, I, I think you're right. Um, just like in the same way that uh, white people couldn't talk about, about mass incarceration outside the context of Orange is the New Black. Like when you, okay. when you could, yeah. when you could point yeah, out that our drug laws were so insane that cute blonde white women were doing significant time in prison, they're like, oh my God, the horror! Yeah. You know, we have, we need reform right this minute. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always been that hope, just like with um, with SNCC, when you have white kids who are being killed by white segregationists, the country is able to see the moral horror of segregation and what these people are capable of doing. Now, of course, it's a metaphor. By saying, uh, by ignoring these people, you allow them to grow to be so powerful that they ultimately wind up posing a threat to you and yours. Um, but we have wound up as the kind of canary in the coal mine position uh, because we have no choice but to, to engage um, with these histories. And then the other thing about Germany is we're kind of like bringing this up. Um, the book that I've been talking about, talking up, um, wherever I've uh, gone, has been uh, James Whitman's uh, Hitler's American Model, in which he talks about the uncomfortable fact that one, I mean, lots of people know that Hitler had praised uh, the United States segregation laws in Mein Kampf, um, but they don't know that the Nazis actually sent delegations of attorneys to the United States to understand how black people have been disfranchised here in a hope that these might be models for the Nuremberg laws against Jews. Mm -hmm. And saying, they actually say, mm -hmm. the Americans have figured this out. Uh, like, no other country really recognizes the peril of uh, impure blood uh, except the Americans, and they're taking proactive steps to prevent this from happening. And so we have to model ourselves upon this. But after World War II, you would almost think that none of this narrative happened. happened. The United States emerged with this kind of heroic, uh, you know, legacy attached to it, uh, that they are the kind of moral arbiters of the world. They convinced themselves that they were an exceptional nation, which is the most dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. Because in this narrative of exceptionality, what it actually does is narrow the parameters of what you're willing to know about your past and therefore constrict your ability to understand the possibilities of That's the present. Right. Yep. And so for people who were shocked that this country was capable of electing someone like Donald Trump, it was because they had never actually looked at what the country has been capable of doing since That's its right. inception. That's right. That's and right. some of us knew that from the beginning. Yeah. And by the way, the American people never consented to go to war against the Nazis. Mm -hmm. They went to war against the Japanese. Mm -hmm. It, it took the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor to get a, 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 a significant enough a percentage of Americans. I mean, Lindbergh, the great hero, That's right. That's right. was on the side of the Nazis. That's right. And a significant plurality of Americans were too, and had no better conception mm -hmm. of Jewish people than they did in mm -hmm. Nazi Germany. So just to keep it real, the American people did not rise up in heroic horror 
about the Nazis and what they were doing to Jewish people, they went to war against the Japanese who were allies of the Nazis. Mm -hmm. So I think our whole heroic narrative is screwed up because we think of ourselves as self-evidently saying Nazism, we'll fight that. Mm -mm. Didn't happen. Well, to note that there are no statues of Hitler in Germany. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. illegal. Just, just, right. so just to make and that there are Confederate yes. statues in Colorado, in New York, they're yes. in upstate New York. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. Massachusetts. <laughs> right, yeah. They're everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we were talking about the responsibility of white people or for white people taking the lead. So I wanted to just read um, a quote from Mayor Mitchell Landrieu's speech mm -hmm. about removing mm -hmm. monuments and then ask you whether removing monuments would has the impact that we think it might. Um, I, I'm just curious to know where you are. So here's what, uh, one piece of what Mitchell Landrieu had to say. It immediately begs the questions why there are no slave ship monuments, no prominent markers on public land to remember the lynchings or the saved slave blocks, nothing to remember this long chapter of our lives, the pain, the sacrifice, the shame of all of it happening on the soil of New Orleans. So for those self-appointed defenders of history and the monuments, they are eerily silent on what amounts to this historical malfeasance, a lie by omission. There is a difference between remembrance of history and reverence of it. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. It's a very powerful speech that you know you should Indeed. really read all mm -hmm. of it, but mm -hmm. that, that was just one that I thought um, stood out. Now this was on the occasion of talking about why they were removing those monuments um, in uh, New Orleans, and as you know, Four of them were removed, mm -hmm. and they were paid for by a still anonymous donor, the removal process, mm -hmm. I don't know who that is. So is there, um, what happens when they're removed, okay, and then yeah. what? I mean, what's the power of the removal of these, of these monuments? Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, monuments are for heroes. Mm -hmm. Monuments tell you what you commemorate, what you lionize, what you think is valuable. I see no value in a monument to Robert E. Lee, who was a traitor mm -hmm. in every sense of the word. He was a vicious slave owner who treated his own, what he thought of as property, horribly, who kidnapped free black right. people during the war to, re to, to enslave them, um, and who betrayed his oath. There's nothing gallant about going to war against your own country. As a member of the military, he should have been stripped of all of his rank and his pension. He was a Scoundrel. There's nothing heroic about Robert E. Lee, sorry. Nothing that I can think of. Even his own descendants disdain him. You don't put up a monument to someone unless you admire them. I, I'll take a monument to Harriet Tubman, to John Brown. Mm -hmm. Give me the monument to the, the Quakers who hid black people uh, along the Underground mm -hmm. Railroad. Give me monuments to greatness. If that's what you, if, if that's the purpose of them. So I don't feel a bit sad for people who don't want to see the monuments go. Um, and I was on the air when the, you know, the Tiki Torch Nazis with their citronella scented mm -hmm. protests right. uh, descended on Charlottesville. Um, I, I guess it's that's like, all they could buy. Like, Walmart. Like, is there like a lot of mosquitoes in Charlottesville? Like, what's, going, what's happening here? It was very, yeah. I, I always, I just think of that march be, looking like a Klan rally and smelling like citronella. <laughs> I mean. But I mean, I was on the air when, you know, Reverend Blackman got snatched off of our air mm -hmm, live on mm -hmm. TV because the, 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 the Nazis were, had brass knuckles on and were beating pastors. Mm -hmm. You know, they were punching people with collars on. So do I feel sorry that they're sad that their monuments are going? No. I'm not, I wasn't so much thinking about how, whether they're sad or not. I'm asking whether or not the removal of the monuments is important. Yeah. I still here's, remember yeah. his. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here's, here's one thing about that. This is one other thing about like those like tiki torch people, right? Um, which was like the level of paranoia with them was, um, was breathtaking. When they were chanting, um, you will not replace us. There were some that were chanting, Jews yes. will not replace mm -hmm. us. Yes. They were chanting, you will not replace us. And you know, I've spent a lot of time around kind of left activist types, um, you know, Black Lives Matter folk. I wrote a really long piece about you know, the origins of Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I talk to these people a lot. No one has ever come up to me and said, keep it to yourself. We're gonna replace the white people. <laughs> don't, don't tell them. <laughs> like they'll never see it coming, right? I, I, that's not that's not on anyone's agenda, 
Um, but, but what they were worried about was being replaced in a, from their position of primacy. That when we talk about equality, for many people that's an ideal, and for many other people that's a losing proposition. So what they meant was you will not replace us at the top of American society. And that's what they were fighting for, um, that hierarchy, that ideal of white supremacy. And, and so the idea of kind of removing these monuments, um, oh, one, other, one other thing too, about just really quickly about the, the New Orleans thing, people kept saying these things about heritage, they're not about hate, they're not about racism and so on. Uh, they removed the monument to the Battle of Liberty Place which was when a white mob displaced the interracial police department, police force of New Orleans by force, removed all of these black and white um, officers, many of whom were killed by this mob, and then they erected a monument to this, and they said that this was not about racism. But literally, at the base of the statue, it said, dedicated to the cause of white supremacy. <laughs> so it's like, you know, this is like the level of denial that we're dealing with. If someone says, for white supremacy, and they go, no, it's not about that, you know? Um, and so, in removing the statues, we remove a present insult, but we simultaneously remove the marker that lets us know that there were and are people in the society who believe that these individuals were worthy of honor. And so that becomes a kind of absolution because five years from now, people don't even remember that that thing had ever been there. And so I think that those statues should be amended in ways. I'm in favor of placing markers that say, this statue was placed here in the infancy of our moral understanding. And when we reached a greater level of humanity, we recognized that these were monuments to our shame. Mm -hmm. and, and that has to, that has to be the message that we, that we say, that we send to people in, in future generations. What about moving them into museums? I think, here's, here's a thing that I find really interesting, right? I spent um, a semester in Moscow and um, one of the most interesting things I did there was I, I visited the Red Army Museum. And it's this incredibly like, modern building with all of these kind of the history of the Russian army and um, just a really, really well done um, image, uh, imagery and everything. There's this one photo which is like maybe the size of like, almost this wall here. Uh, and it is a photo of, of the point where Hitler's army was 60 miles outside of Moscow. And uh, you know the the Russians had just decided that you will not enter Moscow, and they had the image it was an image of the people digging the trenches to make sure that the Russian army, the uh, German army, would not enter the city of Moscow. The trenches were being dug by 60 and 70 year old women, which was like it remains one of the most affecting things I've ever seen because they were saying every single one of us will do whatever we can to prevent you from coming here. You will not come here. And at great, great, tremendous cost, the Russian army, the Red Army, uh, moves west and takes Berlin. And when they took the Reichstag building, they took that uh, German eagle off the top of it, they took the Nazi flag, they took all of those things, they took all those things down. And when I got to the museum, everything was immaculate in this museum until I got to the part from the Reichstag building and all of those monuments were displayed on the floor. Hmm. There was a cordon around them, but it was a very clear message hmm. that you will be commemorated, but you will be commemorated in a position of subordination. Hmm. And so when we remove that Robert E. Lee statue, we should put it in a, in a uh, museum okay. on its side. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> in the face. <laughs> And by the way, just <laughs> just for interest, Robert E. Lee didn't want a statue. Yeah, that's years, right. So that's right. We should we should note that. Um, so let's talk about the American flag. It's not a mm -hmm. it's not a Confederate monument. It's not a Confederate flag. It's the American flag, which has entered into our consciousness yet again in this new um, um, conversation about. Well, one that Colin Kaepernick kicked off, but it's been ongoing. It, come, mm -hmm. it comes and it goes with black folks, certainly. 
first let's get on the record about where you are about kneeling mm -hmm. <laughs> and what that means mm -hmm. and whether or not you think it's been impactful. I, I think that his, uh, part of his message has been lost. We keep trying to bring it back, but it mm -hmm. keeps going away from that. And people have sort of gone over to the sidebar about whether or not this is disrespectful to the flag mm -hmm. because we're all Americans. So I think it's being intentionally lost. You know, I mean, yeah, I think right. it's being it's being lost because mm -hmm. people refuse to deal with the message that Colin Kaepernick very explicitly said that it was about. I mean, remember when Colin Kaepernick first started this protest, he didn't even recruit anyone else into it. He just stayed on the mm -hmm. bench mm -hmm. during the anthem. Um, and he winds up in a conversation with a former Marine who says that he thinks it's disrespectful to sit for the anthem, but that if he really wants to make a statement about police killings of black men, which is what this was about, it was about black people who are being killed and no one's being held accountable. And he feels that he can't venerate, uh, he can't stand and sing this stirring anthem knowing that the protections that it, it involves and it talks about in terms of the constitutional protections are not extended to black people. And he said very clearly that's what it was about. And the kneeling came out of a negotiation or a conversation with that Marine. Mm -hmm. So that's what his protest is about. It's about the, the, the I mean, constant killing. I mean, when, it, when it got to the Tamir riots in these 12, my God. And they, I mean, tried, and they tried to make it seem like it was his, his fault. Right. And he's, it's his fault in portraying him as well, a man. He's a he child. After they arrived, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so if we're getting to the point where we can't, or even our 12 year olds can't play cops and robbers with a toy gun without being gunned down um, by a cop who shouldn't have even been on the force because mm -hmm. he didn't pass the psych exam, my God, you know, why wouldn't you kneel? Mm -hmm. So I think that people are losing the message because they want to lose the message. Mm -hmm. And again, I go back to the fact that if you're going to defend, if you're going to oppose what he's doing, based on the national anthem itself being sacred, remember it was just a hit song that Woodrow Wilson's kid sang. Mm -hmm. right. It was not some sacred thing handed down even by the founders of the country. There was no national anthem. We're not North Korea. You're not required to venerate the flag. Um, and so I think he is perfectly within his rights to continue. I think that people like LeBron James who have, used, who have risked their, their fame and fortune to stand up for him are heroic. They're the modern day Muhammad Ali's. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I applaud these athletes. A lot of these guys are one generation out of poverty. Mm -hmm. they, they're taking tremendous risks with, um, with money they don't necessarily have. And, you know, That's right. They, you know, these guys are, football players have a very short shelf life. You know, they're battering their bodies and destroying themselves and in some cases risking getting cut. If you're a Dallas Cowboys player, you're risking losing your livelihood to kneel. So I think these guys are heroic. I, mm -hmm. I applaud them. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that Joy is absolutely right. Um, and so when we look at this, I mean, this, it then becomes like the kind of selective vision, um, you know, of the country's history. So, you know, that flag flew during Jim Crow. That flag flew during uh, the essential American colonization of the Philippines. Uh, and what, you know, the, when the United States uh, incorporated Puerto Rico because they were hoping to uh, uh, profit from sugar, from sugar there. You know, all the things that we have done, um, that flag flew when Lieutenant Callie killed the Vietnamese. You know, all the things that have actually desecrated the ideals of the flag. But we, we cannot look directly at American history. And because we fail to do that, because we're incapable of doing that, we is can it, then is be it distracted. we can't or we can't uh, let a black man look at America? No, history. what I mean by that, when I say we, I say that because I, I like adamantly insist of black people as being part of this, this entity, this bigger undertaking. Like I could say that we understand that we as black people understand this, but there's a downside to that um, because outside of America, we actually diminish our ability to influence what this country does. And so when I was talking to, like after 9-11, um, and I was talking to uh, uh, another African American who was like, you know, that doesn't have anything to do with us, but what this world does, what this country does around the world, and the things that we do that make people hate us, and, um, you know, that's not about us. And I said, that had better be about us. Mm -hmm. Because if there was a group of people who understood what America was capable of doing based upon our own experience, capable of doing to other people because we had seen what was done to us. And we abdicated that and said, I refuse to have anything to do with that republic, with what this republic does. We are then co-signing their ability to do these things abroad. 
And so I think when we say we, it's like an insistent we. It's, you know, Martin Luther King's we. And so because we as a society refuse to look unblinkingly at what American history is, we then get distracted by shiny objects, like saying, this person is kneeling, uh, he's dif you know, disrespecting our troops, uh, and we kind of have these things that are, that are slogans but not ideas, or cliches, but there's no actual idea behind it. Uh, and if we haven't had any other um, comparison, we have lived for 10 months now in a presidential administration that has disrespected two different Gold Star families, that has insulted the intelligence community, that has insulted the independence and tried to corrupt the independence of the judiciary, that has used the office of the presidency to promote personal profit, that has used the pulpit of the Oval Office to attack individual private citizens. Those are the things that are disrespectful to the flag. So how do you account for the level of anger about it? I mean, it's, 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 it's not um, even the usual, you know, I'm mad at black people. It is a level of intensity, mm -hmm. it seems to me. Um, again, started by Colin Kaepernick on this particular front. But it just seems, is it just me? I'm feeling it's more intense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe, oh, yeah. May, yeah and, and I'm trying to get to, what, where is that coming from? And, well, I think yeah. the intensity of the anger is equal to the intensity, the investment in the heroic narrative of the country, okay. right? And I think that people, first of all, I find it very, you know, somebody who grew up a football fan, this weird merger of football with America itself, mm -hmm. as if that, this is, it's a sporting event. But people have invested it with sort of it being the very, the very sort of essence of America. But, but think about what it is. This is a, you know, the athletic leagues are the last place that we talk about owners of other people. <laughs> where we talk about the owners who are almost overwhelmingly white and male and the product that they're putting out there, the meat that's on the, the field is 75% black. Mm -hmm. it's, it's people whose entire lives are sort of in the hands and at the behest of these so-called owners, you know, who can turn on and off the spigot of these young men's finances at any moment. And these are the same men who are the most vulnerable to the very kind of state-sponsored right. murder that he's protesting, right? When they take off that uniform, they're the very thing that Americans fear the most. And July and I are talking about this on TV, right. a big black man. Right. It's the thing that has sparked terror in the minds of even s slave owners, mm -hmm. that they thought that if this man gets free, He's going to do to me what I've, what I've been doing to him. That's right. He's bigger than me. Mm -hmm. He's got to hate me, mm -hmm. right? I've taken everything from him. This fear of black men is as old as the Republic. <laughs> and so the idea that these men who would be victims of, I mean, they are they, driving a car, and these guys have nice cars. They're, they're victims waiting to happen. They're Tamir Rice's, you know, in maximum. So. There's a lot of irony to this viciousness. I think part of the reason that people feel such viciousness is A, bl you know, black people are expected to respond to success with gratitude, That's right. not with pride. That's right. Um, the idea that their success is, uh, is something that they owe their fans for, not their own talent, but they've given, they're, given, to, given them. to them, and they're, they're ungrateful. And the same people who worship you know, a man as president just because he's rich mm -hmm. and think that that gives him license to do whatever he wants, think that these guys ought to be grateful for their riches and that they are essentially spoiled and rich. So I think it's bound up with feelings that people have really, quite frankly, toward black people mm -hmm. um, and toward, and I'll say, the last thing I'll say on this is I remember after the Charleston mm -hmm. shooting, a pastor friend of mine texted me and said, you know, and then said, you know, I'm a pastor, so I maybe shouldn't say this, but what is this? constant expectation that we have to respond to amazing viciousness and brutality That's with right. amazing grace. That's right. That we're the only people who are told when they slaughter you and your kids, amazing grace. Mm -hmm. When they put you in chains, amazing grace. No matter what they do, you amazing grace. They disrespect you in a store, amazing grace. That if we don't respond with grace, then we are seen as a threat. Mm -hmm. That anything else we do but grace and gratitude makes us almost evil mm -hmm. in the minds of some people. I think it's still that core 
innate response of this country to what it was. You know, it was a slave republic, and people still haven't quite gotten comfortable with the idea of completely free black people. I mean, it's a trap in, in, in that they want you to have the concession prize of believing that you are morally superior to your enemies. Right. You say, oh, you're morally superior to your enemies. And you, but your enemies are economically superior, militarily superior, uh, they're living uh, a longer lifespan, they're enjoying all these kinds of things, but don't worry because you have a kind of moral superiority over them. And I was talking to my nephew um, who is, at the time, I think he was 19 um, when, when Charleston happened, and he said he, he was furious. He called me when, you know, um, when the forgiveness thing happened. And uh, I said, uh, I, was, I was, I agreed with him, but I was in this position because I'm his uncle that I was not supposed to agree with him. <laughs> right? So I said to him, um, you know, they forgave him because uh, they don't want to be destroyed by hate. And he said, they've hated us for a long time, and they seem to be pretty, doing pretty daggone well. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, true, you have a point there. You know? um, but I do think that that's the point. Like, we did not respond to 9-11 with any kind of spiritual equanimity. Mm -hmm. We responded to it with these declarations and bombast about American military might. And we have been responding for 16 years, like inflicting our vengeance upon the world for 16 years because of the memory of what has happened um, on that one day. And so there has not been uh, you know, a moment of, uh, scarcely a moment of spiritual reflection about this. So where do we, what do we do? I just want to note that Colin Kaepernick has been um, noted or, uh, or um, held up by GQ magazine as a citizen mm -hmm. of the year. He's not speaking, they're just really great pictures of him because he wants to let what his actions speak for them. So in thinking of that, I'm wondering, what can individuals do? You know, you hear this, and I, I tell you what, my phone calls are people, I can't listen to the news, I don't want to talk <laughs> about it, I know you have to, but I don't want to hear it because I'm just too worn down. I'm beaten down, um, I feel the intensity that we've talked about, Really, General Kelly is going to tell, talk to me about a compromise on I mean, it's just on and on and on. So it feels a particularly fraught time at a place where we don't have leadership that many of us uh, respect. What's the, our response individually? I mean, we obviously there are organizations working, but what can we do? And, and if people do, it, it is exhausting, right? It is sort of like a fire hose, you know, of bad things coming at you all the time. Uh, I will say on Colin Kaepernick, I would have preferred he had voted to well, be hello. citizen if he was well, going to be citizen of the year. Yeah. It, that's my one knock on him is mm -hmm. this idea that you know he had that same false equivalency that both sides are bad, therefore I won't vote. That's my one problem with him. Mm -hmm. So citizen of the year, I think, fundamentally involves participating in the electoral process. I think if you're a citizen, that is that is your job. Mm -hmm. And if you think about what um, people, what 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 that, what what were the components of freedom? that black people and brown people have been fighting for. What, what were they fighting, what were they actually fighting to do? Um, there's that saying that I can't remember, I never can remember who said it, that you know, we cannot make, this is in the 1950s, that we cannot make uh, you know, the, the sort of vicious southern sheriff respect us, or respect our bodies, but we can damn sure vote and change the sheriff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, that core um, requirement of democracy, voting, is still the, the, your, each citizen's one opportunity to affect the maximum change for themselves, their community. Um, and so I think what, what, I, what I implore citizens to do is register to vote, please. Register everyone you know to vote. Mm -hmm. We still have places like Mississippi, places like Alabama, places like Georgia, particularly in the Old South, where there are mm -hmm. hundreds That's of right. thousands, if not That's millions right. of unregistered, particularly black people. That's right. We have a Latino community that is 15% of the population and no better than six or seven percent of the electorate, even in elect, mm -hmm. even in presidential mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. they undervote by half their strength. You know, and then, and then on the flip side of it, we look at white men who are thirty-one percent of the population and hold seventy-one percent of the political offices in this yep. country, like vastly disproportionately uh, represented mm -hmm. in this. 
And though those things, though that disparity, and when we look, and when you add white women in, it goes up to 91%. So all of the people of color, if you were African American, if you were Latino, um, if you were Asian American, if you were Native American, we are all shrunken down into 9% mm -hmm. of the elected offices. It's something called the Reflective Democracy Campaign. If you go to their website, they have all of this information um, there. So we are dramatically underrepresented. And that is like one of the first things um, that we have to address yeah. if we're going to talk about having more equity at the table. Totally. Um, yes, I know. We're, we're, I'm at the end of my time, but you, this is your time to ask questions. We have some cards going around and I will read what you have, would like some answers. Okay, no, this is some bad handwriting, but I'm gonna work with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, in light of the African Meeting House serving as a safe space to black people from 1806 onward, what role does a safe space in black life play today, especially in light of assaults on HBCUs presently? Mm. So it's interesting, um, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> very. Uh, and the reason I say it's interesting is that I'm in the middle of writing um, a profile of the president of Howard University, and we had that exact conversation. Uh, and interestingly, James Comey, the former FBI director, um, is doing a fellowship for this year, uh, this academic year at Howard. Uh, and the students, when he came to give a speech there, uh, a number of the students, you may have seen this kind of going around, uh, you know, stood up and protested his presence uh, and, you know, very uh, irate about, you know, the person who uh, used the term the Ferguson effect, saying that Ferguson had made police uh, too uh, tentative to actually do their jobs and who had been reluctant to uh, refer to Dylan Roof as a terrorist. Uh, and whose FBI had uh, conducted surveillance on Black Lives Matter, all these other things they thought were very um, problematic. But Comey said something I thought was interesting in that speech, which is that he said um, the reason he accepted the fellowship was that he respected Howard and its tradition of being a safe space for black people and uh, for people who still have to shelter the burden of racism and uh, oppression in American society. And I think that we've always had to, to do that. Uh, I think that's an important thing. But when I was at Howard, um, we had kind of two imperatives. One was that we, and I see one of my students, Ms. Spellman, um, uh, who was in the audience too, like hopefully this was like the same in my classroom. If not, don't, so don't say it wasn't. <laughs> um, but, but our idea was that we had to have this space to ourselves um, where no one was going to um, be skeptical of your ability because of your race. No one was going, to give, was going to cater to you or give you anything that you didn't deserve out of some sense of guilt because of your race, but you were going to rise and fall um, on your own merits. You know, the founder of Howard, actually is a white Civil War general, Oliver Otis Howard, tried to create a school and he wanted to uh, hire white teachers and then realized that the teachers were also racist that he couldn't entrust them to actually teach. He said, no one can be taught by someone who doesn't respect them. So he said, we then have to create a school to provide black teachers in order to actually go teach in the other schools that we want to build. Um, and I think that is the kind of lineage and tradition that those institutions have. That's the first part of it. The second part of it was that we had to leave home. We, had, we couldn't stay within that kind of cloistered safe space. We had an obligation to go out and into the world and to do battle with ideas or to um, you know, serve uh, these communities. To, we were always taught that we were being educated on the behalf of people who would never ever set foot on a college campus. And that when we finished our time, we had to move out from there and actually be uh, able to fight on the behalf of those people. Uh, and so I think that it's both of those things and it's important for us to maintain and preserve the idea of safe spaces it's also important for us to recognize that you really truly grow by being in dialogue, even when so often in hostile dialogue, mm -hmm. um, with people who are trying to advance an agenda that's antithetical to yours. Um, Jelani, I didn't see the bottom of this, which says that you gave a lecture at Brown University and said you didn't believe in safe spaces. <laughs> so is that? Oh, that kind of safe space. Yeah, it's different. Okay. You want to? Yeah, yeah. That? <laughs> no, no, no. We're not talking about that. Okay. Um, okay. What I meant by that, what I meant by that was. Um, I don't believe 
in the non-engagement with people who you find to be hostile yeah. to you. I always talk to students of like, um, when I was talking with the students, as a matter of fact, about Comey, I was like, Malcolm, Malcolm debated those people. Yeah. Malcolm went, James Baldwin went yeah. at <laughs> William F. Buckley. Yeah. You know, and Buckley didn't know what hit him. Mm -hmm. He's saying this little short dude from Harlem, like yeah. what does he know? A little short high school grad from Harlem. Yeah. I'm from Yale, and Baldwin wiped the floor with him. Mm -hmm. um, and it was because Harlem in one other level had been that safe space, that place where he you know, like cultivated his skills. Yeah. But I don't believe, sometimes I see um, a kind of reluctance to do the second part of it, mm -hmm. to actually engage with people who you disagree with. And just as, I think I gave this comparison when I was at Brown, uh, you know, my father and grandfather were boxers. Mm. And I grew up kind of like messing around the boxing gym, whatever, we go to the gym. And, you know, I, was, I started learning on the heavy bag, uh, and I'm hitting the heavy bag, and I'm getting good, I've learned all these punches, uh, and I'm, you know, just working heavy bag, and like, I'm, I'm, I'm dangerous, I'm bad. <laughs> and it was like, okay, now we're going to spar. And the thing that I learned very quickly is that <laughs> It's much harder when someone's punching back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like, true. It, you gain this kind of sense when you're talking to people who agree with you all the time. Mm -hmm. You gain the sense that I had when I was working the heavy bag. Yeah. And then when they put me into spar, I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> this is different. Punching me in the face. Right. Yeah. <laughs> punching me in the face. Like, literally, this is like what it was. I was boxing a guy who was like a, a smaller than me, but really quick. And I kept seeing his hand moving back. <laughs> and I didn't know what it was. And I realized it was because he was punching me in the face, <laughs> and I was just seeing the hand come back. Um, and so don't be that person. Yeah. We need people to Punch avoid that kind okay. of phenomenon to actually go out and engage people you disagree with. Okay. <laughs> On a personal day-to-day -day level, how can people in areas that had a particularly violent community history, such as Boston in the 1970s, start a one-on-one -on -one dialogue that will acknowledge, accept the history, but bring about a space where a healing and forward-looking dialogue can take place and continue. Yeah, no, Boston, if it, well, mm -hmm. you guys obviously know that history, but it, it, Thank you. a lot of people are surprised, but my students are often surprised. We did a module where we talked about um, the riots in Boston over busing in the 1970s, and they were surprised to find out that the fight against integration was as vicious and violent mm -hmm. in the North as it was in the South. It was Chicago, New York, mm -hmm. you know, Boston, everywhere. Um, integration, school integration, et cetera. You know, I'm not sure, I think I might, I, mean, I don't know if we both agree on this, but I'm not one who thinks that the reason to do dialogue about history and to confront it is to create a kumbaya, mm -hmm. right? I, 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 you know, even though my name is Joy, <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily think that that's the goal. I think that you have to confront your history because it's healthy, even if it doesn't make you feel better or doesn't bring you closer to your former opponents. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it's nice when you have these stories on TV where they bring together the woman who was screaming at the kid who was trying to integrate her school with the kid, right? And they bring them back together or they bring the people who were in Arkansas fighting on the other side, opposite sides of Little Rock and they confront each other. That's nice, but that's so rare. Mm -hmm. Most people die feeling the same way that they felt mm -hmm. when they were vicious in the 50s, right? There's a guy, Doug Jones, who's running for Senate in, mm -hmm. in uh, Alabama, you know, prosecuted the men who blew up the 16th Street Baptist Church. One of, you know, they all, the, the two that died, died in prison. I doubt they, I mean, maybe they had some moment yeah, at yeah. the end where they felt, but it's more likely that they felt the exact same way. Mm -hmm. And most people are right. still gonna feel the exact same way. That's not why you do it. You engage with your history because it makes the country more mature. And I think we have to, th this country needs to, to grow up in a lot of ways and engage with the history <coughs> even when it's painful because it's a sign of maturity. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we can move on. You know, there are, there are things like, you know, uh, deciding what we're gonna do with our, with our elder, with our poor. You know, Europe is going through this now that now that they have immigrants, they're rethinking whether this social safety net was such a good idea because they're not sure they want the immigrants mm -hmm. to get it. It's a mm -hmm. human condition to be tribal. This tribalism is unfortunately part of the human condition. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily think that individuals can try to find these dialogues to sort of create kumbaya, because I just am realistic about human nature. Mm -hmm. And I think what you really get is an education, not necessarily a new friend. And, I, and that's sort of sad, but I just, my experience with, with this country's history is that the two sides generally stay on two sides. You know, there are moments that are much more hopeful than that. But for the most part, this country has to deal with its history because we're not able to move forward if we don't. 
how can we encourage the media to include more women and people of color in the dialogue? I'd oh like to know God. that. Jo Amen. Joy oh, it's been does. nice. It's been nice. I'll Joy see you all. <laughs> Amen. Joy does a great job, this says at the end. So. And Melissa, I mean, we met through yes. Melissa Harris Perry. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. how we met right. yes. because yeah. we were both guests on her show. Mm -hmm. And, right. and I, you know, I, I'll be frank, I got my diverse team the old fashioned way. I inherited it. I inherited it from Melissa. Mm -hmm. And before, you know, if you think about where I work right now, there are exactly three black executive producers in the whole building, uh, three black women. There are zero black male executive producers. The majority of the black men who work in 30 Rockefeller Plaza work in security or in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, I'm hanging on to every black male producer I can find and trying to get them jobs when they come to the end of what's called yo. They, you know, they sort of turf out. Um, we do not have even close to enough Asian American mm -hmm. people on air or behind the scenes. They're even, even worse shape than African Americans. Not even close to enough Latinos. Not even close to enough black people. Not even close to enough women. Mm -hmm. We have a terrible problem with diversity in the media. Terrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem is that the people who hire lack diversity at their level and That's don't right. notice That's when right. there's no diversity. Right. It won't occur to them. You know, I'll, you know, I'll tell on my own company, they put out a, a, a press release about a new digital pro project that had all white people and one woman. Mm -hmm. And nobody noticed. Nobody thought to say, this is weird. <laughs> this does, there's, you know, it, unless the people who were doing the hiring notice right. that there's a diversity problem. On our team, when I inherited Melissa's team, and as we added, you know, I'm very deliberate about trying to add more diversity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and promote it. And so I think what you have to do is if you're working and you're in a position to get young people of color jobs, to get them into internships, to get them opportunities, please do it. Um, because it, it starts with somebody who's already in the door, pulling more people in the door. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's one thing, like, uh, so there's like a little uptick um, around Obama. And that was because uh, I think people did have the, the consciousness to recognize that there were more black people living in the White House than working for their company. <laughs> and it was like, and then also. It's true. Yeah, but I mean, and a lot of times this was literally true. It would literally be the case. Um, and so the other part of it was that, you know, uh, uh, when um, I was joking with ta Coates about this, and he wrote this um, reparations thing, I was like, Obama was trying to get people reparations because they were hiring all these black people to explain what was happening. Like, it was like, it was, what does this mean when he does this fist bump thing? Like, find, 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 us, a the, black person. find us a black person who can translate this for us. It's true. Right? Um, but, but on the, the very real side of it, um, you know, I was at, I guess this was uh, two years ago, the City and Regional uh, Magazine Association Conference. And not to just blow them up, because you could pick a bunch of other different organizations, but this is the one that I, that I attended. And the city magazines are all like, you know, Boston Magazine, uh, Washingtonian, New York Magazine, Denver, like all the magazines that are around cities, connected to the Chamber of Commerce, they cover stories that are interesting, but also really want to help promote the city. Detroit Magazine, no black people. Chicago Magazine, one black person. Atlanta Magazine, no black people. Birmingham Magazine, no black people. Um, Washingtonian in Washington, D.C., no black people. Um, and so I was wandering around, like, I was on this panel, and I was like, like, wait, what is it? This is like a joke? Like, and so we were having this conversation, and, and I said, uh, the way that I got my foot in the door, as a matter of fact, ta and I both got our foot in the door at the Washington City paper, was that there was an editor there um, who later went on to the New York Times, an editor named David Carr, who came to the city paper, um, was like, I'm in a city that is at that point 60 something percent black. There are almost no black people working here. Why don't I go to the black university across <laughs> town and ask them, hey, are there any English majors here who might be interested in writing? Um, and he picked me and ta in his first group. Like that was, his fledgling effort was that he got, got us as his uh, interns. And so I said this to these people. I was like, you were in Birmingham. <laughs> you were in Detroit. Yeah. It's like you were in Chicago. I guarantee you there are black people who read. <laughs> and write. And have thoughtful <laughs> opinions about what they've read. 
and actually can conjugate verbs and write something in response to something. Okay. It was like um, it was like that kind of level of basic thing, but it, they don't think to do it. Yeah. They and we, replicate themselves. Well, and also that, t that you have to also remember that people are not just conversant about their own identity. You know, we are very deliberate on our booking team um, about saying, okay, we want to talk about the economy. Mm -hmm. There right. are lots of economists who are not white men. There mm -hmm. are women and Asian Americans, and you don't have to only book Asian Americans to talk about China, and right. you don't have to only book right. Latinos to talk about immigration. Like, right. you can find a Latino economist, you know? And so we challenge our team, our booking team, to find, you know, I, I tell them, find me someone else mm -hmm. that's, that's different and diverse. Um, you know, Melissa show used to have a, a, a saying that when, when, he, when, when Melissa would say, get me diversity, she meant find a white man, because it yeah. weren't enough white men. Yeah. So diversity meant a white guy. Because yeah. sometimes we'll look at our panels. We, do, we don't do this on purpose. Sometimes when um, we do the show from DC, we'll have some guests who are remote and some who are at the table. And every so often, just because we've booked, we needed a conservative and a liberal, and we need somebody who knows politics and somebody who knows Capitol Hill. When I get on set, I look and I notice they're all black people. And so we'll say, chocolate sundae, you know? <laughs> and we'll take a picture because we don't do it on purpose. We literally just, literally just wanted these, these different things, and it just turned out all the black people were at the table. And so, but when all the people are white at the table, no one notices them. No. No. no one no. notices it. And that's the problem, is that we have to start noticing diversity well, some and the lack of it. Not everybody knows. I don't, I don't know if you remember this, but this was like, I don't know, two or three years ago, there was an earthquake. And I remember where the earthquake was, but there was like this coverage. And they were like, uh, we have found the president of the National Geological Society to explain what happens. And this brother comes out. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's a brother on TV, he is not explaining like why the police need to be stopped from shooting people. Right. Like he is actually talking about rocks and plate tectonics and these things. And I was like, all right, we have it overcome. We've got like this much closer to it though. Yes. <laughs> Like, I don't know if you were kidding about the fist bump thing, but this is a real story. When uh, President Obama was running, he did this gesture oh, at yeah. an event. Yeah. And a black reporter, at Jacqueline Trescott, had to write a piece in the Washington Post <laughs> explaining to her people that is not an aggressive gesture. That means something. That, no, she, she had to, no, this is real. <laughs> they were about to say, what kind of militaristic thing was he doing? Oh my God. That was a real story. All right. What is your opinion on the difference between opi opioid coverage now oh, and the crack oh. getting started? <laughs> Let me tell you. First of all, I'm going to start by saying that the opioid thing is real. We, I, but when I, uh, I had a, sh a show during the day that got canceled, so I went back out on the, uh, out on the trail as a reporter, uh, and my my assignment was to co cover Hillary Clinton. So I followed her early campaign uh, events in, in 2015. Um, and so she went to Iowa, New Hampshire first, as you know, most candidates do. And Iowa, New Hampshire, I have never seen so many people on drugs. Mm -hmm. wow. And these are white people. Mm -hmm. Everywhere we went were tweakers, people mm -hmm. who had tattoos all the way up their arms that were trying to cover, but they weren't mm -hmm. covering the needle marks. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to a Subway sandwich shop. The guy behind the counter was a tweaker. The guy making the sandwiches was a tweaker. Um, when Hillary Clinton sat down and did these round tables, you had white grandmothers talking about raising their grandchildren mm -hmm. because their daughter it was strung out on drugs. Um, uh, unbelievable. It's, re it's not, they're not making this up. You know, and this was Keene, New Hampshire, little town where there was nothing going on, no industries, no nothing, just dollar stores and tweakers. Mm -hmm. So the opioid epidemic is real. Florida, it's an epidemic in Florida. Um, but what's different about this and the crack cocaine epidemic, when I first moved back to New York in the 1980s, you would see the heroin man mm -hmm. who'd be leaning, he'd be mm -hmm. on the subway stop in the L, you'd be surprised he didn't fall over. Mm -hmm. There were, you know, my godmother lived in the Bronx, there was one crack addict that lived in the alley that could run him off, he would come back, he brought, once he dragged a mattress, he had a whole living room set up, mm -hmm. I mean, he was very industrious. The difference between the 80s, when you had this incredibly intense crack, crack epidemic in New York, where I was living, and now this opioid epidemic, uh, epidemic is one word, sympathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy and sympathy, that the media portrays this as victims of, of a drug culture and drug companies who have victimized these poor people, and we need to intervene it as a crisis. In the 80s, the, the drug addicts were criminals. They were no good. They need to be locked up. They need to be locked up with the dealers, not just them, but every, lock them up. 
And so I think that the, the media is partly responsible for this portrayal of these two realities, which are the same reality, mm -hmm. as being completely different morally. You know, I'm glad that we're treating this drug epidemic with the empathy that those, the victims, that its victims deserve. I just wish we'd had the same empathy when the victims were black and brown. And unfortunately, we didn't. No. And, and oh, you're right. And I think for me, like the kind of cynical perspective, like what I was saying earlier about oranges and be black and, uh, you know, the white SNCC uh, people who were being killed, uh, that my hope all along has been the empathy that people are able to muster for um, opioid addicts will translate into reforms in drug laws that have the side effect of benefiting black people. Mm -hmm. um, because it's difficult. When I, was, when I lived in Georgia, there's juvenile justice laws. Um, you know, where Georgia had this idea that they're going to get tough on crime and tough on crime. And they passed these uh, draconian laws uh, that was so poorly written that literally a 15-year-old and a 30-year-old could rob a liquor store together and the 15-year-old get a longer sentence than the 30-year-old would. Um, they were incarcerating people as young as 13 in adult prisons, which then meant that they were super vulnerable to uh, sexual assault, to all these other things, and it also was making them much more likely to reoffend. Um, and all these things were happening. Lots of African Americans around the state are um, organizing around this. And it's not until you begin to get rural white parents pointing out that Joey, who's a good boy but just got in trouble once, and now his life has been thrown away. Um, or or uh, my David Jr., uh, who played Little League and you know, loved football, but he got mixed up and made a couple of mistakes, and now he's paying this. Uh, exorbitant price for it. Like that, people were able to have that conversation. And so the conversation around juvenile justice reform was incidentally beneficial to black people. Um, maybe I've like lost idealism, hmm. um, but the, that's where very often I find myself hoping that white people will recognize, oh, as we were talking about outside, mm -hmm. We gutted the social safety net because we thought black people were benefiting. Mm -hmm. And now we recognize that we're impacting a whole lot of white people. Mm -hmm. So maybe we actually need to make reforms about this. Or uh, when we started talking about police violence and black people were disproportionately, unarmed black people, mm -hmm. disproportionately killed by police, but we are not the majority. That's right. If you were to remove all the black people, all the Latinos from American society, something I think would make a whole lot of people happy. Um, but if we were not here, and you simply had to deal with what American society looked like for white people, one of the things that would immediately jump out is, holy hell, we are killing a lot of unarmed white people. Hmm. And they would be able to see it because of that. And so when we're having this conversation, because we think of these things as affecting black and brown communities, uh, we associate these issues with them, we're able to sweep them under the rug and say that this is a permissible state of affairs. But we have to do this, the work of pointing out to white people the ways in which they've been disadvantaged um, by the set of ideas they've bought into. And by the way, you know who was really smart about that was Linda Johnson. You know, Linda Johnson, because mm -hmm. he grew up poor and he grew up in a you know, racially segregated uh, Texas, what uh, was able, when he was putting forward the programs of the Great Society, he understood that he had to constantly sell them as just as much for rural white America as sure. for black America mm -hmm. to get them through. If he had just, yeah. if the Great Society had been able to be just portrayed as a redress for the descendants of slaves, it never, no, no right. one would have done it. But he understood that you had to constantly keep in mind the rural white poor. Um, and you had to constantly vocally advance their interests and knit them together with the interests of black people. One of the sort of greatest tricks ever pulled, um, and not even by a magician, was to convince poor white people that their interests were any different than poor black people. Mm -hmm. And to convince them that, that this secret ingredient of race somehow elevated their position even if they had nothing in the bank. Um, but that trick has been brilliantly played um, by people whose only interest is the super rich. You know, the very wealthy are very lucky that the white poor don't figure this out. Right. 
because uh, because because they got a lot of guns mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're right. very angry but right now they're right. angry at us right mm -hmm. they think we did it they think the immigrant did it they think the muslim did it they think that you know non-christians did it the people who took prayer out of sc schools did it they think their lives have been ruined by us god help the rich if they figure out that it's them mm -hmm. and i think lyndon johnson understood that if you try to keep those two communities even if they don't like each other keep them understanding that their interests are the same, right? That they both need to have the social safety net the same way, they'll both fight for it. And then that's why you had so many white Democrats. The Republicans really sort of brilliant trick, I have to say, was to decouple economics from the interest, from what people believe their interests mm -hmm. were and to replace it with something else. The reason Roy Moore still has a chance to win, even though people feel literal physical revulsion toward him, is because they've been convinced that the only thing that matters is making abortion illegal. Mm -hmm. That there's crowd on everything else, nothing else matters. Even if, if Roy Moore is gonna come in and take your Medicaid away, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Just abortion. So I mean, getting people to isolate their interests is, is it's quite a brilliant trick. Even in, in Alabama politics, this is a really quick thing, in Alabama politics, um, you know, I remember uh, visiting relatives in Alabama. This was not long ago. This was like four years ago. Uh, and this was uh, around during the primaries. So you're like, every time you turn on the television, it's like a besieged, you're besieged by these campaign ads. Uh, and you know, I remember uh, you know, one person was on and he's running for some office and he said, my opponent believes in evolution. <laughs> And I was like, is this where the bar is? Like, for real? Like, this is where the bar is? Um, but one of the other more notable things was that, um, that they had this question about legalizing gambling in Alabama. And the then governor was opposed to legalizing gambling, allegedly on Christian grounds. Uh, and so it was like, you know, we can't do this because it's, you know, it's unchristian. Now, of course, he was also getting campaign contributions from the people who had legalized gambling in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, we happen to not want competition in Alabama. But the fact of the matter is, like, if it's sinful to have gambling, it's equally sim sinful to take money that's produced by gambling. But that didn't factor into it. And no one's having that conversation. They're like, oh, he's right and godly, and, you know, we have kept gambling out of the state of Alabama. Um, and it's like this masterful uh, game of kind of distraction that seems to never ever um, get old. Mm -hmm. All right, this is going to be the last question, and I'm saying this because Joy is going to answer it first, and then she's going right out the door to get her plane, and then Jelani will answer. Okay. <laughs> Am I going out that door ready? or that door? Which, which door? <laughs> which, which door? Which door? I, your stuff is that way, so you're going that door. All right, so well, she'll be out. going right out of here. Okay. All right, here we go. With the shutdown of independent news outlets, Gawker, Gossipus, and DNA Info, Oof. what challenges do you anticipate independent journalists will face moving forward, particularly when it comes to the topic of race? Yeah, uh, you know, that, it was very chilling to find out that a couple of very wealthy people, one in particular, could shut mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. a news organization just for information they didn't like. Donald mm -hmm. Trump would love to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. He's been very explicit that if he could just shut down uh, he's talking. To, he's talked about taking away NBC's license. Yeah. Um, they've challenged the Time Warner CNN deal, the, the Time Warner uh, merger deal, saying mm -hmm. they have to sell CNN. At the same time, they're opening the way for this company, Sinclair Broadcasting, to sweep up yeah. Tribune stations mm -hmm. and essentially create a mega Fox News state-run media where they put in prop literal propaganda with your traffic and weather together in your local news. Um, so it's a it's, it's a very fraught period um, for journalism, but it's also a fact. Um, that uh, tyranny is, 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 is and, uh, and autocracy in a lot of ways are an illusion. They think they've succeeded because you can sort of physically subdue a population and, ma and, and make the autocrat feel that there is no more opposition, but there's always opposition. And you can't really squash it. You can quiet it for a time. You can push back on it. You can even subjugate it for a time, but you can't kill it. There will always be independent journalism. Um, you know, there will always be voices who insist on telling the truth about America's history, including on race. They cannot shut that down. And one of the reasons they can't shut that down is that now it's no longer in the hands of a CNN or an NBC or even a Gawker. Independent media is literally you 
and the people who follow you on Twitter or your friends on Facebook. You can be the broadcaster to your own small group, your, your own small audience. And you can't shut that down. The independent spirit is very hard to squash. Um, I, my husband and I went to Cuba in February, um, which I always find interesting to say to people who say that we uh, that sort of admire that country as sort of a model of socialism. I always say, you know, think again. It's an, yeah, really. it's, it's an authoritarian mm -hmm. hell for yeah. those people that are there mm -hmm. when, they, when they'll tell you. And what I found was that when you first have a conversation with people in Cuba, I speak Spanish enough to be able to talk to them, they'll say, oh, yeah, no, everything is good. Second or third conversation when they're comfortable with you, they'll tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Even in a society where they've completely squashed the ability of people to have a newspaper that's independent or a radio show that's independent, one-on-one, -on -one, they'll still tell you the truth. They're still fighting that regime. So the reality is I don't think independent media is going anywhere. I think that it will always find a way out. It will always find a way to break out. Um, and, and, and I think that for that reason, that's the small kernel of hope that I have. The truth is not dead. Uh, it's not even dormant. And Donald Trump is sort of forcing it out of people who don't even want to accept it. Mm -hmm. Joy Reid, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Jelani Cobb, you get the benedictory statement. Okay, on oh, that same question? <laughs> oh, yeah, same question. Okay, uh, yeah. so um, I think to, to Joy's point, I think that that's um, crucial that we look at uh, the ways in which we can all participate in this kind of um, information sharing. These things have never been easier. There are, I think, some challenges. So one of the things that's happening is that um, in the middle of the country and uh, Columbia Journalism School, where, I've, where I work, uh, has done a lot of work around this, kind of documenting it. But in the middle of the country, it's essentially hollow, you know, where news organizations have collapsed and you know, local news organizations uh, have declined precipitously and people haven't figured out how to make those business models work. So the New York Times survived the translation, transition to digital, uh, the LA Times survived, the Wall Street Journal survived, uh, and you have, interestingly enough, uh, to kind of talk historically for just a minute, um, we had this idea about populism and you know, the resurgence of populism. And the belief was that populism was uh, you know, historically directed at large forces that have control over individual people's lives. When populism first emerged at the beginning of the 20th century, they were concerned with the banks. And they thought that banks were ruining the lives of specifically farmers, that they had too much power and too much control. Uh, and even when you uh, get to the beginning of the 20th century uh, with like Teddy Roosevelt, his campaign is that he's going to break up the trust, that companies are too big, they need to be broken up and so on. And this is specifically relating to the ideas of populism. In the 21st century, this populism that we saw in 2016 was anti-black, which populism often has been. Uh, but when they looked at the huge, powerful uh, institution that they saw controlling their lives, they were talking about media. Uh, and so because you don't have a local news editor who, whose kid plays softball with your kid, mm -hmm. um, or the person who you see at the PTA uh, or any of these other kinds of things is much easier to put out the label of saying something is fake news uh, because you don't know anybody in New York, uh, you don't know anybody on Wall Street, you don't know anybody in Los Angeles, you don't know any of these kind of big places where media has survived um, or CNN or MSNBC or the kind of large things. And in, that, in the place of this, we've seen the rise of things like Breitbart, which you know, is not news, it is a propaganda outlet, but it's providing people with something. And so we have to be, I think, very particular and very intentional in crafting outlets that are able to uh, address those ideas, uh, saying that people have to, uh, just having a New York Times is, uh, is not good enough. You have to have a kind of local and hyper-local uh, institutions and outlets. And this is one of the things that we talk about all the time in the journalism school with our students. The person who's going to go out to the town uh, where you might not have the glamorous 
uh, kind of story, but you actually find out what's going on there, which is crucial to those people, and then in the bigger sense, vital to the entire industry. And so it's not simply a question of um, kind of black people and white people talking across the lines of race. There are all these other kinds of lines and dynamics that are crucial that people have to talk across as well. Um, if we're actually going to do the hard work of supporting, maintaining, and really, really rehabilitating democracy in the United States. Jelani Cobb. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good night all. <laughs>